So I'm Josh Wheel. I, I'm the uh, HVAC uh, Technical Service Manager. And today's class is, we're going to go over Navian. This is what they call, this is Navian's class. I'm just teaching it. And this is what they call level two. So level one's more of like a sales, you know, product offering type class. Level two is classroom. We'll cover best practice for installation, basic and advanced setup, and um, air fault codes. I always go over the combi first because there's a lot of redundancy from the combi to the water heater. You know, venting, gas piping, all that stuff. So I do the combi presentation, then I go to the MPE and talk about that basic setup and uh, recirculation. If you guys got questions, don't hesitate to ask. For those that haven't been here before, coffee's over here. There's some snacks, bathroom in the back, water cooler in the back. So if you got to use the restroom or grab coffee, just get up and do it. <coughs> Who here works on the combis? You guys water heater guys? Who's your water heater? Who here's never worked on them? We never <laughs> better find some wood to knock on because I was just out on one yesterday. <clears throat> so, for a combi boiler, again, we're talking combi, we're talking it does space heating, domestic heating, and then uh, domestic, or space heating and domestic hot water. And we're going to talk specifically about the wall hung. They got stainless steel heat exchanger, 95% efficiency. Who here knows what AFUE means? I don't know. Annual fuel utilization efficiency. What's up, gentlemen? There's three seats here. One seat there, and it looks like one in the back. So they got a total of five sizes, five different sizes. Really good turndown ratio, meaning we can turn down ratio, meaning we can modulate down to very low capacities if that's what the load calls for. Right? It's a modulating boiler. So if we don't need a lot of heat, there's not a lot of load, we don't need to, to, to use a lot of gas. Right? We don't need to go to 100%. We can sit there at uh, 25%, 30%. Can do two, or two to three inch venting options. And you guys are going to have to tell me if I get in your way. <clears throat> and we'll cover that more in detail. We got our control panel, this is the setup, we'll talk about that. They now have built-in zone control for up to three zones, whether it be zone valve or pumps. So if you're doing three or less, you don't need a, a Calefi or a Taco zone relay panel. You can do it all through the boiler. <clears throat> So kind of what we're going to go through here, specifications, components, what the warranty is, go over installation, gas piping, which is huge. That's the biggest problem I run into with these is gas piping being undersized. Talk about water piping, vent, condensate, wiring, dip switch settings, which is key. Talk about advanced and basic setup, error codes, and then startup. What's up, Dave? Yeah. So you can see we got the five different sizes. We've got the 190 to the 250. The second number, that is your space heating number. So that's your capacity for space heating to, to, to heat the house, to heat the building. You can see here on this first one, the small, the little guy, max of 60,000 BTU space heating, we can turn down to 11,000. So if we don't need, you know, on like this time of year, where you could have it gets in the fall, where it might get up to 65, 70 degrees during the day, and then it gets down to, I think my truck said 28 degrees when I was coming in this morning. So mid-afternoon, you might only need 11,000 BTUs to heat the space. But as it gets cold overnight, we might have to crank it up. <clears throat> the 
This is your actual BDUs because remember it's 95%. So we lose five of it in the venting. We take 5% of our um, fuel and we just send it out in the flue, right? So we're not getting the, so that's your, that's your actual BDU right there. <clears throat> so here's more in-depth capacity. Here's the thing I want to talk about on your domestic hot water side because this is the other big issue I see. Especially who here has, means you guys are, are plumbing's your main game, right? Like you guys, are you guys seeing a lot of people put like uh, low flow faucets in anymore? And they want those real cute looking, low flow, aesthetically pleasing. <clears throat> what about, what's a typical shower head flow rate? Do you guys know? What's that? 2.2 is typical. What about a kitchen faucet? What's that? Like 1.5 gallons per minute. For, we need a half gallon per minute flow rate to, to activate the domestic hot water heating. So it's got to have at least a minimum of a half gallon per minute to activate. And I've been on jobs where they've had hot water cold water hot water cold water very inconsistent and each job i've been on has been when they have those real like uh aesthetically pleasing low flow faucets that was just hovering around half a gallon right so that flow switch was just off on off on so that burner off on off on so keep that in mind if you got low flow faucets but the other the other uh thing you got to keep in mind let's take a look at the 190s Typically we're coming in what? What's our street water coming in at? About what? 52, 53, 55? Am I wrong? Huh? And then typically what are we trying to heat the water to for domestic? 120. So let's say we're coming in at, at 52 to 120. What is that? 68 degrees difference? At a 67 degree temp rise. For these two small ones, the most we're going to get out of this for domestic hot water is 4.3 gallons per minute. So if somebody's going to try to fill a hot tub, they're going to have problems. If you've got a house where you've got multiple bathrooms and you've got the kids came home from college and you've got multiple showers going at the same time, they've got the dishwasher going, they're... Uh, Somebody's at the kitchen sink, and we exceed a total of 4.3 GPM through these two small guys, you're going to have hot, cold, hot, cold. It's not going to be able to keep up. So that, keep that in mind. And this is why I've been talking, Steve, you've been in a lot of my classes. What do I keep saying? This really sales guy should be at this class. Because they're the ones who go out and sell this, and then you guys install or service it. Keep that in mind. Even our biggest combi at a 67 degree delta T, 5.6 GPM is the most we're going to get out of it. Does anybody have a, a... What if you need more? What if you, just the house, it's a big house, got multiple bathrooms, multiple kids, it's got a lot of domestic hot water load. It, is there a way to overcome that? What's that? Well, we could t we'll talk about cascading. You can cascade the water heater. And cascading means you could put two, three, four, five water heaters pipe them into the all together you can calm and vent them and you can overcome it that way what's another option you have tank what's that tank storage tank right you could do a a storage tank where basically you have a tank you got the combi you have a tank for the domestic you have an aquastat or an etc temperature controller 
and a circulator. So if the tank says, I need to heat up this water, it energizes the circulator, that induces the half gallon or more, brings the heat on, you heat the tank up, and then you can just pull off the tank at whatever GPM the tank can provide. But, uh, but stand alone, keep these numbers in mind. And that's the big one, that 67 degree temp rise is your typical. So even our biggest combi is 5.6 GPM. <clears throat> Venting, I think most everybody uses either PVC or CPVC. Who here uses anything else, anybody? We gotta have at least three and a half inches to 10 and a half inches of water column for our natural gas. We gotta have at least eight inches to 13 and a half inches of propane. What happens if we go over 14 inches on a gas valve? I don't care what kind of gas valve it is, whether it's a gas furnace, boiler, water heater, what happens if you, you go over 14 inches? Does anybody know? It locks up, gas valve won't open. It's a safety feature built into all gas valves. So if you go over 14 inches, which is half a pound, that gas valve will not open. You can change it, keep swapping valves, keep swapping valves. If that, if that inlet pressure is 14 inches or above, it will not open. So your max for LP is 13 and a half. Temperature range for our, our uh, Space heating, 77 to 185. For the supply, return, 68 to 158. And our domestic hot water, 86 to 140. 140 is if you go into commercial mode. I mean, typically residentially, you're not going to go above 120. This just gives you the uh, dimensions, hookups. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. You guys can just refer to your service manuals. These can be one pipe or two pipe vented. So you can take combustion air from inside the space, but how do you guys, how do you determine if you can, if you're, if you're capable, if you're able to take combustion air from inside the space? So it is, for every 1,000 BDUs of capacity, you need 50 cubic feet of space, free space. Meaning you can't just look at a, you know, a basement that's stuffed full of shit, you know, up to the roof and just packed. It's gotta be free space. So for every 1,000 BDUs of capacity, you need 50 cubic feet of, of free space. If you wanna take the combustion air from inside the space. So just keep that in mind. Most of these, everybody, most IC installations I see, it's two pipe. We're taking combustion air from outside. <clears throat> Got our domestic inlet and outlet, heating return, condensate, because again, this is a 90 plus percent uh, appliance, so it is going to condense. Major components, we got our ignition transformer, igniter assembly, and flame rectification. We got our combustion exhaust blower, dual venturi, gas valve, control panel, control board. <clears throat> so here's our gas valve. This is a negative pressure appliance. It's not like your standard gas furnace where you stick your manometer on the manifold and you're going to look for three and a half inches. You're not going to see it. This is negative pressure. How this works is this combustion blower pulls the gas up this tube into the burner. So it is negative pressure. So again, it's not like your you know, rooftop where you come up, you stick your manometer on the, the manifold side and Oh, I'm looking for three and a half inches or I'm looking for 11 inches, you're not going to see it. It's going to be like a negative 0.1 to negative 0.2. 
very slight negative, but it's going to be a negative. <clears throat> There's our burner assembly, water pressure sensor, this is where our condensate, auto fill valve, boiler pump, it's our transformer, domestic hot water assembly, air pressure sensor. Again, this does condensate. It does have an autofill, we'll talk about that, but that is preset to 12 PSI. So basically if, if that boiler loses, goes less than 12 PSI, this fill valve is going to open to allow water into the system to try to build that pressure back up to 12. If it doesn't get back up to 12 after five minutes, it's shutting off. Why is that? If you have a leak and you don't want to just keep pumping water into a house and flood it, <clears throat> you can change that. Those parameters can be changed, but default's 12 PSI. And again, if it falls below that, fill valve opens until it gets back up to 12 or five minutes. And this is just a close up of the domestic hot water. This is the boiler pump. There's not two separate pumps in the combi. This is the boiler pump. That's your heat exchanger. So it's taking the, the space heating hot water into here and then we're pulling off to, to heat our domestic. Three-way valve, mixing valve, there is a screen in here that might, on maintenance, or if you're having a flow issue, flow restriction, you may have this restricted, this screen. <clears throat> Certifications, I'm not all that worried about. Here's the other one to keep in mind, guys, and this is why sales guys should come to this class. <clears throat> Out of the in residential applications, this is residential installations, you get a 10 year heat exchange five-year part, but you get a one-year labor. Does everybody know that you get labor with Navian? You did? <clears throat> so if you guys have a unit that's under warranty and you're out there and you're troubleshooting it, what's your, what are you, who are you supposed to call? What's that? For who? <clears throat> And the reason being, not that I'm trying to pawn off work on the Navian, and I'm okay if you can't get a hold of them and you just need a question to be answered, if you bought it from us. If you bought it from Wind Supplier or Joka, don't call me. i tell you that. But if you bought it from us and you have a question or something about it and you, and you can't get a hold of Navian or it's taken forever, by all means, don't hesitate to call me. If I can answer it and help you, I will. But all warranties go through Navian. So if it's a warranty part, how that works is you call in, they create a case, and let's say, Allison's, it, you got a bad mixing valve. They're going to overnight you a mixing valve. There's no paperwork. It's going to be no charge. It's going to go direct to you. You have to ask for labor. I can tell you by experience, if you don't ask for labor, they're not going to give you labor. But you get it up to one year, and I tell you what, they just updated last year their labor schedule. It's pretty good for a, a manufacturer, manufacturer's labor schedule. So if you have to replace a part under warranty, and you have a case number, and I would definitely ask them what the case number is when you're talking to them, write it down, and ask when your check is going to be mailed out, because they send a check directly to you guys. It doesn't run through us, like other warranties, like Ream, or Fujitsu, where we'll process a credit and just credit your account. It is a check directly to your company from Navian. But you have to ask for it. Because I'm telling you, they will not just arbitrarily send <clears throat> So keep that in mind. If uh, you've got a failure within a year, get your labor. Because you're leaving money on the table if you don't ask for it. You can, if we have parts, 
like I've got some guys um, from York and Hanover here. If we do have parts and you're in a jam and we do stock some Navian parts and you have, you know what I mean? And it's a, it's a water heater and they're down and you can't wait a whole night or a whole day or two days to get a part, then we'll make it happen. We'll, we'll get you a part and we'll get the warranty squared away. But in a, in a standard situation, you should call Navian, tech support. They'll diagnose it with you. They'll create a case. They'll send you a part, no charge. There's no paperwork. And if you're, do your due diligence and stay on top of about labor, you'll get a, your company will get a check. If you're slick enough, maybe you can get them to send it to you direct. <clears throat> so here are the accessories that you should have with every boiler. Obviously the install manual, the IOM. The install manual is different than the service manual. There's not a lot of service related stuff in the install manual. It's basic setup, it's basic installation. For troubleshooting, and troubleshooting each component, in whether it's a water heater or a boiler, this is the manual you want. So this is the one for you service and installers to keep on your truck. Because it goes into great detail for every component how to troubleshoot it. What voltage, what ohms, whether it's continuity or no continuity, what readings you should get on every component. And it also tells you, shows you how to disassemble <coughs> and remove that component. Who here knows that you can, and we have two, we have a, an MPE and a combi, so when we take a break, if you want to go back there, the MPE actually is heating our, this building, our office, hot water, and then our combi is just for training. But both panels are off back there, so if you want to take a look at live units, you can take that entire, those entire boilers apart with one long Phillips head screwdriver. The entire thing, you can remove every component and strip that thing down bare with one long Phillips head screwdriver. This, like I said, is level two training. So this is classroom, this is kind of basic training. Level three, <clears throat> and typically they come into our area once a year. So it's, and usually it's limited to like 16 guys and gals. Level three is they bring in boilers or, or water heaters and they have you guys tear them down completely and then put them back together completely. That's level three. <clears throat> level four, is they have a live training center in New Jersey. And it's a two day training. You would go to New Jersey in two days with the Navian trainers and you actually get, with, they give you meters and hand tools and you actually go with live fire units and work on them. <clears throat> You're gonna get two inch termination screens, wall flanges, obviously your wall bracket, screws and anchors, it's going to give you a relief valve for the space heating. LP conversion kit comes with every water heater or boiler. And we'll talk about how to convert. Your outside ambient temperature sensor, maintenance part kit, and a high altitude conversion kit, which we don't have to worry about that here in Pennsylvania and or Maryland. <clears throat> Accessories that don't come that you'd have to purchase separately, condensate neutralizer, zone controller, temperature sensors that you could do on supply return. If it's in more of a commercial application where you want to operate these strictly off of supply or return. <clears throat> NaviLink Wi-Fi control, which I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm sure you guys are all seeing this. Everything's going to people want to be able to operate their shit remotely. They want to be able to say, Alexa, turn my shit on or turn it off. Right? That's where everything's going. So you might get requests for that. That allows them to control their water heater or boiler from their tablet or iPhone or whatever it may be. And that technology is not going away across this industry. So it looks like there's a majority of younger people in here. 
But that's where it's going. Soon you're going to see like what Ream's doing currently. Like our Ream line, that's our air conditioning line, and it's probably the same for, I would assume, for train, where I came from. I would assume it's probably the same for Carrier. I assume it's probably the same for Lennox. If you purchase a Ream mid-tier to high-tier piece of equipment, and I always keep using this like it's a phone, but um, it's all set up through Bluetooth, through your phone or your iPad. There's no more dip switches. So airflow settings, staging, blower off delays. Well, guess what? That's coming to Navian. So here in the near future, all your setup will be through Bluetooth, through, uh, through your phone. And I have to assume that's going to be through all HVAC lines throughout our country. <clears throat> you can get a dirt separator. Manifold system. This thing's nice. We quote these on every job, I think, that we sell, that, we, that we're quoting to you guys, is this manifold assembly because it's just Rather than building your own, it's already put together. I think most guys and gals like it. And you can get the hot button wall plate. Basically, that's on-demand recirculation for your domestic hot water. You just hit the wall plate. That's more, I would think, for like hotels or efficiency apartments, so on and so forth. <coughs> Any questions up to this point? I know this class is kind of boring, but you got to go through it to get to level three. And that's why it's important you guys all sign in with, so that I can read your name, I can read your company, and your um, company phone number, so that you guys, for attending this, go on record with Navving as having level two training. Because when they do come into town for level three, you have to have shown that you've gone to this training to even be to try to get on that list for the level three, if you, if you choose to. <clears throat> so we'll fight through this, but we'll get through it. <clears throat> All things you gotta consider when we're doing, uh, we're gonna install, and I would consider these before you actually start installing it. Where are our connections, our gas, water, electric, right? We're gonna need those three. We gotta get rid of the condensate. Right? It's condensing water heater or boiler, so we've got to get rid of the condensate. <clears throat> How are we going to vent it? Can we get two pipes out? Are we going to be able to stay within the, the, the maximum length requirements if we're going to go two inch or three inch? How close to the fixtures? <clears throat> So before starting, verify you got the right stinking boiler or water heater. You'd be surprised how many times over the past 20 plus years I've been in the wholesale side tech support that somebody has gone in and installed a rooftop or a air conditioner or a furnace or a boiler or a water heater only to find out afterwards that it was the wrong voltage, the wrong size, the wrong gas. We're not perfect as distributors. We try to be, but we're not. So always verify you got what you were supposed to have before you actually start tearing it apart and putting it in. So we want to make sure you have the right gas type. Make sure you have the right gas pressure and capacity. Because what's a typical residential gas meter rated for as far as BDUs? Most are 250, 250,000 BDUs. That's what that meter at your, resident, at your residence is capable of providing. So let's say they've got a gas furnace. They've got a gas fireplace. They got a gas stove and they had an electric water heater. And your salesman went in there, their water heater shit the bed Salesman went in there and sold them on, well, you put in a Navian water heater. It's going to give you on-demand water heating. 
You know, you're not gonna have just water sitting in a tank losing heat, right? It's gonna be high efficiency. Well, if with that gas furnace, that fireplace and that dryer, they're already at 230,000 BTUs of capacity and you add another 200,000 BTUs with this water heater, you're not gonna have enough. That meter is not big enough. You will have issues with all those appliances as they, if they try to run at multiple appliances, furnaces. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. They might have to upgrade the meter. <clears throat> water pressure, is it street city water? Is it a well? There's things to keep in mind. And electrical supply voltage, that's not a big deal. Typically these are plug-in. You just plug these into a 15 amp outlet. <clears throat> but should you have anything else, any other electrical loads on this circuit? It's best practice not to for electrical, inter electrical magnetic interference with flame rectification. I've seen they will, a lot of times they will work. You can put them in. I only bring this up because, yeah, it might work 99 out of 100 times, but that one time it doesn't, it's going to bite you in the ass. So I recommend you make sure it's a dedicated circuit, dedicated outlet. There's nothing else on there. <clears throat> here's your clearances. So here's the one I want you to take a look at, the front, four inches. Who here does service? Good luck with that shit. <laughs> so yeah, Navian's telling you, they, they only care, they're fine with four inches. But think about if you have to service it, get in there and replace any of these components, because everything is here. And you guys can take a look, we take a break back there if you haven't already seen them. <clears throat> Gotta have 12 inches from the, the ground. Nine inches from the top, half inch from the back, but that, um, the mounting bracket gives you that. Boiler mounting, they give you a bracket, and they got these two uh, lips here that you can, you just hang it on. So very simple. I do this in every class also. So guys that have been in my classes before are probably sick and tired of hearing this same joke I give every time. But here's the one I want you to keep in mind. Avoid mounting on common walls to reduce sound transfer. Do you know why? Because I, for the past 25 years, have been in the tech support side, and I go to a house, and I get there, and the homeowner goes, shh, can you hear that? And that's what I'm fucking there for. Pardon my language. <laughs> so my point being is sound is important to consumers. I'm telling you. Some of these, I've had, I don't think Fry Lutz is here, or, yeah, it was or Garden Spot. I went to a job site two years ago in Lancaster, not on a boiler, but on a, a heat pump. The homeowner cried because of the noise. She cried. Like actual tears. Because of a little bit of noise this heat pump was making. So, yeah, we can laugh about it in here, but I'm telling you guys, for your customers, it's important to a lot of them. So keep that in mind when you're doing an install service. <clears throat> Noise is a big deal to the consumer. <clears throat> so these boilers on the combi side doing space heating, you can do all kinds of applications. They can do baseboard, we can do radiators, we can do radiant floor heat. We could do air handler, uh, hot water coils, which that's kind of how we have the setup back here. We're, we're feeding the hot water coil for our uh, training unit. <clears throat> but make sure you size that boiler right to do the job. Who here knows a company do load calculations when they're placing a HVAC system or hydronic system? Or are they just going in and saying, oh, that's 100,000 BDU? I'll sell you another 100,000 BDU. I would recommend doing load calculations. I get it. 
a lot of this in, in this the sale side of things here is uh get in get out just get the sale let's look at the nameplate and just sell them the same exact size thing but that original unit might not have been sized correctly might have been oversized might have been undersized right <clears throat> Water quality. And I don't know, I, I live in Camp Hill. Any means, any of you guys live in Camp Hill? How's your water quality? I live up by the hospital and it is shit. Like my fall, my, and now I moved into this house a couple years, you know, like six, seven years ago. I've had to change out all of the faucets and all of the fixtures because they were just so restricted from all the buildup inside there now i'm and guys i'm telling you i'm not a hydronic expert probably some of the guys the other guys here from uh, faggers probably have more experience with hydronics <clears throat> but i can tell you it makes no sense to put in one of these water heaters or boilers if the water quality is shit and you're not going to do something about it because you're going to either chew through heat exchangers or you're going to restrict heat exchangers and no amount of maintenance is going to get you out of that mess. And it's going to be a pain in the ass. So I would highly suggest if you're going to put one in, have the water quality checked. And if, it's, if it doesn't meet the requirements, sell them a system to, to, get, to, to get good water quality. Because you're not doing yourself or them if you put one of these in with horrible water. And these are just different examples of piping. This is probably going to be your most, for space heating, probably your most typical. Does anybody know what kind of uh, piping system that's called? You, I'm sure you guys have all heard the term primary, secondary, right? We got the primary loop and then we pull off of that to our secondary, to our loads. So that's your typical when you're gonna have radiators or baseboard. You can do a hot water coil on an air handler. And I will talk a little more about piping here coming up because it is key. You got your domestic hot water side and that's why guys, for you guys that just do water heaters, that's why I do the combi presentation first because a lot of it's redundant <clears throat> and that gives you recirculation are these water heaters and combis instantaneous hot water they're on demand hot water not instantaneous hot water right so it gives you as soon as you open a fixture and it gives you half a gallon, it's going to turn the burner on and start heating the domestic hot water. But depending on how far the fixtures are away and how long it takes for that burner to heat up and to heat the water, it still could be 30, 60, half a minute and a half before they actually get hot water to the, to the fixture. So that's key when you're talking, especially again, why sales guys should be here. When you're selling this to the consumer, make sure you clarify on demand is not the same as instantaneous. <clears throat> so if you want more of an, like an on demand or closer to on demand where they're getting hot water to the fixture faster, they have what we call recirculation. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that more in detail coming up. But that allows you to get hot water faster to your fixtures. <clears throat> and then you brought up cascading where you could do let's for example we have let's just say it's a hotel where they have they want to heat their offices their conference room or whatever but then they also have their laundry right so maybe we do a combi so we for space heating three water heaters because we need a lot of hot water demand for the laundry room or the kitchen or whatever. <clears throat> so 
So basically, these act as one water heater, one big water heater. It's just one system. So you can do cascading. <clears throat> you can cascade, and I don't know, Dave, you might know the answer. I think it's 16 is the most you can, water heaters you can cascade. And you can common vent them, too. I believe it's 16 is the max. But primary, secondary, back to the piping, that is going to be your most common and, and most recommended piping is primary, secondary. <clears throat> and so, why do primary, secondary? I have to imagine all of you know this answer. I have to imagine all of you are more hydronic experienced than I do. Does anybody know why primary, secondary? So notice how it has maximum of four times the dimension of the pipe. So if that's a one inch pipe, the distance between these two pipes has to be four inches or less. So the distance where these two pipes come in from your secondary loop is four times whatever the primary loop diameter is. And the reason being is we've got a pump in the boiler and we're going to have a pump on our system. If we spread these out, this pump can affect the flow of this secondary loop. And vice versa, this pump can affect the flow in the primary loop. So we have to keep these within these parameters so this and this don't affect each other. Those two pipe pumps do not affect each other. <clears throat> so it creates hydraulic separation so the boiler circulator and the system circulator can coexist. They can operate at the same time and they're not going to screw with each other. That's why I would highly recommend just buying the manifold kit. Again, I, I'm in tech support, but we're a sales company, so I highly recommend you buy everything that, I can, that we can sell you. But for these, for practical purposes, just get the manifold kit because it's already pre-built. You, know, you don't have to worry about it. You just connect it. It's already the primary, secondary is already built in. But that's the purpose of primary, secondary. We've got a circulator on the primary. We've got a circulator on the secondary. We do not want them interfering with each other. They would need to co coexist. And that's a picture of our uh, manifold. So we have a pump right here, and then we've got a system pump. They need to be able to operate together. So we want, and again, that's why I keep that in mind, and I'm bringing that up. This pump in here, that is not meant to handle an entire system. All that pump is sized to do is flow water right through here. That is it. Maybe you could get away with it on the example I have back in our training center if you have a very short run to like an air handler hot water coil. That would be the only time that you would not need to add a secondary system pump. Because it's only designed, that pump that sits right here, is only designed to induce flow through a very small space and small distance. It's not meant to go out and feed radiator, 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 and come back. No, you won't, it won't do it. What would that short run length be? <laughs> um, When you take a break, look back here, and that's okay. about that. I'd say 10 feet okay. would be the max. And again, that depends, too, on your pipe size. Yeah. You know, if you're an inch, if you're going an inch, maybe you can go 12 feet. If you're half, you know, trying to do half inch, it might only be six feet. So again, there's that manifold kit. I, again, I would recommend it just makes for a much easier install um, when you're putting these in. 
Who here knows how to read a pump curve? I don't know if I can remember how to read one. So, foot ahead. You guys have all heard the term foot ahead? Basically, that's the resistance that the pump is going to, to face. Who here works on um, HVAC, like, like uh, air to air products, like gas furnaces, heat pumps? You've heard of static pressure. Foot ahead's static pressure for, for uh, water, right? So the higher the foot ahead, that's the more restrictive it is. So the longer the distance, the, the, the pipe diameter size, the height it's got to go up, the fittings that are, you're using, all of that increases the foot ahead, which makes, means the higher the foot ahead, the beefier you're going to need for a circulator or a pump to be able to get the required flow rate. So let's say we've got the, uh, in this particular example, we've got circulator on speed three, which would be here. And I need eight GPM. I need to move eight gallons per minute for my system. So I'm trying to size my circulator. I need to move eight gallons per minute. And I've calculated I've got 10 foot ahead. So I've, with my pipe, size, distance, height, fittings, all that stuff I calculated. I got a total 10 foot ahead I'm working against and I need eight GPM. So if I come across here, foot ahead, 10, and I come to eight, I'm below speed three. That pump will work on speed three. It'll get me eight GPM. Will Speed two, do it. No, because I'm above that. So as long as where they intersect, you're below that curve, that pump will work. That circulator will work. If you're above it, it will not. <clears throat> so if I need to move 10 GPM, and I gotta move 20 uh, foot ahead, Will this circulate, three-speed circulator that I'm looking at right now work? It won't. You're going to have to upsize to it. You're going to have to go to a different circulator. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. It's not, and I guess, who here just says, just put a 007 in? That used to be what I heard, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Just throw a 007 in and that'll be it. It's not always the case. <clears throat> And you don't know, if you don't know what your foot ahead, and you don't know what GPM you're actually moving, because think about, if I have, uh, it's the same thing with airflow on a, a gas furnace or a heat pump, right? If I have 150,000 BDUs of heating capacity I need to move to the radiators or to the fan coil or to the radiant loop, you need X amount of GPM to carry that. So if you're short on them, you're not going to give those radiators or those, those, that, that radiant loop the 150,000 BDUs it needs. You're going to undersize it. And what else could, could possibly happen, service-wise? Overheating, high limit, short cycling. So it's very important to know, okay, I've got this boiler, it provides this amount of BDUs, I have all these fixtures that I need to, to supply with this amount of BDUs, Am I, do I have enough GPM to carry the BDUs out there to it? If you, if you end up being short on GPM, you'll be short on BDUs, so you might have longer run times, higher uh, fuel costs not keeping up in real cold temps. You know, all kinds of issues that you could have. So it's very important to kind of make sure this, that your system circulator is sized correctly. <clears throat> so they do ship a uh, relief valve, 30 PSI. What's the standard default pressure for the boiler side of things on these. Does anybody know? 
default, we're trying to maintain 12 PSI in here. So pressure relief, if that boiler sees 30 PSI or more, if everything's working correctly, this thing pops and it relieves water out to relieve pressure. So that's for the space heating side. <clears throat> They also, they ship you this fitting here that allows you to put an air vent and your relief valve right there on the top. Because you really do want to have, to be able to get the air out of the system, have an air vent here that you can open when you're doing the air purge on initial startup to get the air out of it. These do have a built-in low water cutoff. So it's built into it, but, and you guys, I'm not in the field, so I, I, but I hear about it. A lot of, um, especially commercial, and maybe, I don't know, I heard Mannheim Township. Who's here from Lancaster? Is Mannheim Township still paying the ass with their codes? Because I used to work at HVAC distributors down there in Mountain Joy, and I just remember always hearing about Mannheim was a real... <clears throat> Some of these places, they don't, they're not satisfied with the built-in low water cutoff. They want us to actually see an external low water cutoff. So even though it is built into, the, in, into this combi, you may still have to add one because some, some codes may call for it. These, are not, these do not come with the system. You would have to provide them, but, you know, I don't know, some type of air scoop or some type of air elimination. Expansion tank, backflow prevention. Again, these do not come with the combi. You would have to supply those. <clears throat> this is the Navi Clean. This is, again, an accessory you've got to purchase separately. We'll be glad to sell it to you. But it, uh, it helps remove debris and contaminants in the system for better, you know, longer life. <clears throat> Either circulator or zone valves for your secondary, for your secondary uh, piping. That again, you guys field supply. <clears throat> Boiler fill, talked about that. If our pressure, again, it's set to 12 PSI, so you can change that. You can you know, up or down, that's in the initial setup. Built in, default 12 PSI, I talked about it before, if it falls below 12 PSI, that fill valve opens, it allows water back into the space heating side until it gets back up to 12 PSI, or after five minutes. Domestic hot water on the combi, and this is the same on the MPE, so it does not change from just the straight water heater to the combi. It's got to be half a gallon, it's got to see it more than half a gallon per minute for it to activate the burner and start creating hot domestic hot water. <clears throat> Temperature settings of 86 to 140. If you want to go to 140, you have to put it in commercial mode when you're doing your advanced setup. If you don't, it's only going to top you out at 120. So if you need, and uh, the only reason, the only time I've ever seen it is um, I went to this, it was uh, down in I think New Freedom, and it was a uh, bu uh, butcher who was trying to now turn his, he did like deer processing and then just for local farmers, he processed their pigs and their cows and give it back, you know, just give it back to them. It was a direct uh, transaction, but he wanted to now have a storefront and start processing his own. Well, I guess apparently, like everything else in this country, a lot of red tape. Like it's, you had to jump through all kinds of hoops. One of the things they had to be able to provide at least 140 degrees or 100, this is on an MPE, I'm sorry, water heater, they had to provide at least 160 degrees of hot water for the sinks 
to be able to qualify to be able, you know what I mean, for government purposes, whatever, to make sure it's sanitary. On the combis, it only goes up to 140. On the MPEs, you can go up to 176. Is that, is that 176? I don't know. I'm just saying that's how it is. Yeah, 176, but you would have to go into commercial mode to do that. We talked about flow rates. So here's 70 degrees. If we're coming in at 50, let's say 50 degrees, and we're trying to go keep our domestic at 120, that's a 70 degree delta. The max GPM we're going to get out of the biggest combi is 5.4 gallons per minute. I'm going to keep reiterating that because I've run into, and not just on Navians, I've worked with Renai's and Quiet Side and different brands in the past, and I always run into jobs where they're just too much capacity and they're trying to do too much GPM at once and it's just the combi or the water heater cannot handle it. <clears throat> Domestic water, it goes through this flat plate heat exchanger. Right, so it does not come in contact, direct contact with the space heating water. I mean, it has to be separate. You can't, obviously you can't have them. So it is this flat plate heat exchanger. Water comes in and out from the, from the space heating, water comes in and out for the domestic. <clears throat> I gotta keep remember I'm being recorded, so I gotta keep the language. <laughs> you can do recirculation, and again, recirculation, if you have a homeowner, and again, your sales guy should clarify these are not on instantaneous hot water, they're on demand hot water. But if they have a large house and they don't want to turn that hot water, like at my house, I just have a Cape Cod here in Camp Hill. Like my bathroom faucet is probably 20 feet away from the water heater in the basement. And it still takes probably a minute before I start getting warm water coming. Now, some really green people will be against that because I'm wasting that, all that water, waiting for the hot, right? Um, I don't, it's just me, so I don't give a shit. I can wait a minute. Um, but some people can't, just like the noise example I told you about. Some homeowners, they want, everybody wants everything nowadays in this country. Give it to me, instantaneous, instantaneous, instantaneous. I need it now, I need it now. So, your option will be to do a recirculation loop. You're going to have to add, you supply the recirculation pump on the combis. So you will have to supply that circulator if you want to do recirculation. For the NPEs, for you water heater guys, if you have the advanced model, because there's this MPE A, advanced, or MPE S, standard, the advanced has a built-in circulator for recirculation. So it's already inside the uh, water heater. If it's standard, you have to add a circulator just like the combi. And then you can do multiple ways of controlling it. You can do always on, it's always recirculating. Now, what's the benefit of that? They'll basically always have, it'll basically be almost instantaneous hot water for your customer. What's the negative of that? You're gonna be consuming a lot more fuel. And again, there's some dipshit homeowners that th that instantaneous hot water is more important to them than the money. They'll still piss the money away just to have that. So, um, and then you have some homeowners that they want it to operate at zero cost. Right, Steve, you go in there, you put a brand new system in, and then they're calling you with their electric bill. Why, you know, why am I paying any electric for this? You can do intelligent preheat. Basically what that is, it looks at the past seven days of your hot water consumption, your domestic consumption. And it's gonna calculate now, okay, when were they using that? When were the, the, you know, the, the high traffic times for hot water, domestic hot water, that's when I'm going to start recirking at those times the next week. You can set a schedule. So like me, I just, it's just me. I live by myself. 
So I know I'm pretty routine. I'm pretty, I have a pretty standard routine. I know when I take a shower basically the same time every night, I get up in the morning and you know wash my face and hands and stuff. I do dishes, I run the dishwasher. So I could, it, for me it makes sense. I could just do a, I could do a one day, three day or seven day schedule. And I could just say, okay, from 7.30 to eight at, at night, I want you to research. From seven to 7.30 in the morning, I want you to research. And so I'll know I'll have hot water ready to go at those times. You could do Aquastat where it starts to see that, that domestic, get domestic hot drop to a certain temp, it'll start to recirc to bring it back up. And then you could do hot button, which basically that's, that's on demand. It's on a wall, you just press the button and it goes right into recirc. I would think that would be more like hotel application, you know, type thing, a hotel bathroom where, you know, they come in, okay, I'm about to shower. So water rock they rock and roll but again you on a combi or an mpe standard you have to provide the circulator to, to get recirculation there is a connection a recirc pump connection on the boiler that will send a 115 volt output when it's time to recirc to power your circulator. Keep that in mind, the max GPM for recirculation is four. Max amp draw is 2.5 amps. These are the two circulators that Navian recommends do you use if you're doing recirculation on the standard MPE or the combi. And here's your pipe diameters. If you're going 100 equivalent feet, and that means 90s, 45s, because they, they equal X amount of feet. So the combined total equivalent loop length is 100 feet or less, you can use half inch pipe. If you're going above that, up to 400, you gotta do three quarter inch for recirculation. Has anybody here done recirculation on the water heaters or the combis? You have? You guys have Allison's? Are customers happy with it? We had to. We ended up having to do it here with ours because we, we're using MP um, water heater. To, like I said, to heat this office, these bathrooms back here, that hot water's heated. We're heating a tank that's way over here, and then we're pulling off that tank to go to the fixtures. So we do research to try to keep that tank warm and it's still not perfect if you go in there first thing in the morning and turn our hot water on it still takes probably 30 seconds or so to get it off the tank because that's also that we're losing some heat in the tank so <clears throat> oh let me go back here a second So as, as the, the more fixtures we have, and the more pipe we have, the higher the pressure drop, and the more resistance, the less flow we're gonna be able to get through it. So you may, that's why you may, if you're going above 100 equivalent feet, you gotta go to three quarter inch pipe. Because if you try to go half inch, it's just gonna be too restrictive and you're not gonna have enough flow. And you may have performance issues with your domestic hot water. All right, gas connection. And here's a good example. You could have a gas stove, a fireplace, and then you have, if you add up the capacity of all of these appliances, this meter has to be able to supply that, those BDUs. Cubic feet of hour. So if I have 250 cubic feet per hour, how many BDUs do I have? 250,000, right? So one cubic feet per hour is 1,000 BDUs. Because that's how you'll see it on, the, um, on your uh, gas meter. It's going to say 250 CFH. Yeah, CFH. So 250 times 1,000, 250,000, that's the capacity. 
you typically, if all possible, you want your largest appliance, the largest capacity, the first in line off the meter, and into the second and into the third if possible. It's not always possible, especially on retrofit jobs. But you have to make sure the gas line is sized. Because who here has, owns a manometer? Should be everybody in here, but whatever. If I, if I go right now to a, to a water heater, to a, one of these, let's just say an MPE, and I go to the inlet port and I stick my manometer up, and it's, it's natural gas, and I have eight inches, does that mean I have the, the, the right volume of gas? I have the right pressure, but pressure is different than volume. Because I can build pressure against a closed valve and get eight inches. And if I just stuck my manometer on there, I have eight inches, and I say, okay, well, the nameplate says three and a half to ten and a half, I'm good. No, fire that burner off and then see what that gas pressure is. If you have eight inches sitting idle, sitting static, the burner fires off and that drops to four inches, your gas pipe is undersized. You really should see very little drop at all when that burner comes on. You might see, a, you know, it might go from eight to seven or seven and a half, but that's it. You really, you really shouldn't see anything. It should just be steady. So if you are seeing, if you're having performance issues on a water heater or a boiler, check that. That's the first thing I check. I put my manometer on there, look at it when it's sitting idle, not running, and then turn that burner on. And if I see a big drop, I know I have either a regulator issue or my gas pipe's undersized. And that's probably, in my career of being on the, the rep and, and uh, distributor side and tech support, for these combis and wall hung water heaters, that's probably the most common call I've had to go out on job site visits. It's turned out the gas piping was undersized. They didn't calculate the distance, they didn't calculate the other appliances that were there, or they had, they had the, the, the combi was already there. The stove was already there. But then all of a sudden they wanted to get cute and put one of those empire fireplaces in that we sell. And uh, they didn't take into consideration that they're adding another 30,000 BDUs to, the, to that system and it, the gas pipe's just not big enough. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> Again, that's why sales guys should be at this class. Because I always think, and I've talked about this in previous classes, why I think the more as I do, you know, I've been doing trainings for the past 15 years, and we always gear the trainings towards the installers and the techs. But usually it's too late once you guys get to it. <laughs> right? Head it off before... You know, when the sales guy's selling it, to, or sales guy or gal is selling it, to make sure that they're communicating to the homeowner what's on demand versus instantaneous. You know, what, you know, to make sure that the meter is big enough to handle what they're about to add to the house, that the gas piping is right. Because if you go in, and who, who here does installs? And you guys go in and you put in a new, say, integrity, you go in and you put in a and it's just not performing. It's giving you hot, cold, hot, cold. It's not keeping up. You're having ignition failures and you know, intermittent ignition failures. And you get with Navian Tech Support or you get with me and we determine, well, the gas piping's undersized. You have to repipe the entire system. That's, that's a lot of profit that just went down the toilet. So, huh? So there is a workaround. What's that? Survey. Oh, for the sales guy. After the sales guy goes out and sells it, have somebody come back to survey to incorporate that shit they use it. Well, I would just have the sales guy do that when they're there. Well, we don't sell it work. They don't make shit. Well, we have some salespeople in here, so let's not beat them up too bad. But yeah, I do think, I, I do think, I keep, you know, more and more I think about these classes, it would be beneficial for, you know, your sales or your applications people to come to try to head off some of this stuff. It just would make your companies more profitable and more efficient.
we don't, I think we don't, we don't have to worry about this in Pennsylvania or Maryland. Um, everything's set up for elevations of up to 4,500 feet. But again, if at all possible, you want the largest appliance first in line after it comes in from the house, from the meter, and then the second to third, if at all possible. So if you have what they call a half inch pressure drop, this is a half inch pressure drop chart. You could have one inch pressure drop, you have two inch pressure drop chart. How do you know, right, which one to use? Well, if your supply pressure to the house, and this is natural gas, just so we're, everybody's on the same page. If your supply pressure to the house is less than six inches of water column, you're gonna use the half inch pressure drop chart. So if I'm using a half inch pressure drop chart and I've got a 250,000 BDU water heater and I've got three quarter inch pipe, I can only go up to 20 feet piping. Because I have a 250,000 BDU appliance but three quarter at 20 feet of pipe, and that's including fittings, will only get you 247,000 BDUs. You'd be 3,000 BDUs short if you went over 20 feet. 20 feet's not a real long, is it? So you would have to go, if you had to go higher than that, you'd have to go up to an inch. Because an inch, you could go the whole way up to 60 feet, and you'd still be, have enough capacity. Because remember, it's the volume of gas is different than the pressure. You need the volume so you have the BDUs. If you, are if you are more than six inches, let's say you're coming in at nine inches of natural gas, you could go off a one inch pressure drop chart and it's, it's in the manual and it's in um, I mean, it's easy. All you got to do is Google black iron sizing. Now, again, if you're using one of those um, like gas tight, uh, what's what's the stuff we sell? Track pipe. Track pipe. Like you know, the flexible flexible gas stuff. That's more restrictive than black iron or copper. Yeah, so, so they have their own they have their own charts that you need to refer to if you're going to use you know use that. <coughs> But if you, if you were getting, let's say, eight inches or nine inches into the house, you could go up to the one inch drop. You, you, I wish I had a, a slide for it. They, I wish they put it in here. You get much more capacity. Right? You get a lot more capacity in your pipes if you, if, you get to get, if you can use a one inch pressure drop. But again, anything less than six inches into the house, you got to use the half inch. So we talked about this a little bit. This is negative pressure. So this combustion blower is pulling the gas. This valve is opening, and we're going to be positive pressure here. If we're natural gas, we should be three and a half to ten, three and a half to ten and a half inches here. Gas valve opens. This combustion pulls the gas into the up into the venturi, into the burner. And then we count on the buoyancy of that hot flu uh, gas to take it out of the vent. Right, this is not a power venter. Really all they're supposed to do, all an inducer, you know, they call them combustion inducers, draft inducers, whatever. <clears throat> And I'm not very good at drawing. But all it's doing is taking the flue gases and it's just getting it to the exit point of that combustion or, or um, inducer and it's counting on that hot buoyancy, of the, the buoyancy of that hot gas to take it out of the vent. It's not meant to push it, right? It's not meant to force it. It's not a power venter. That's why you, typically I always call them inducers. It's just inducing flow through the heat exchanger. That's it. So 
you start restricting this, it, these blowers are not meant to overcome anything. Right? They're not meant to overcome, you know, the kid dropped his army soldiers down here or a bee started getting a nest, you know, making a nest or so on and so forth. They're not meant to overcome restriction. <clears throat> They're just meant to get get the flue gas here and let the, 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 hot, the boy see the gas do the rest. Take it out of the space. <clears throat> oh, three inch pressure drop. Sorry, it's a three inch pressure drop. I de they do have this slide. Six and a half inches or greater, look at how much more you can do at 20 feet at half inch. That's a lot more capacity if we're getting greater than six and a half inch to the house. So it gives you a lot more flexibility for pipe sizing. So that's why very key to know what's our, what is our, um, I can't see, um, what is our, Inlet gas pressure. <clears throat> Let's see here. Conversion kit should come with an LP kit. And it's just an orifice. <clears throat> so you're going to take four screws out, two screws out, you're going to pull this off from the venturi. You're going to take out your O ring, you're going to remove the existing natural gas orifice and you're going to take the one that comes in the bag, the LP, and you're going to replace it. And that converts it to LP. Every, and every water heater and combi should have that come with it. So you don't have to purchase an extra, you know, it's an accessory LP kit. And little bags inside the cabinet, right? When you buy it. Yeah, should be when you pull the cabinet off. Should be in with the, um, the book, the manual. Because the manual should be in a bag and it should be in there, I believe. So very easy, total of six screws, pop it off, remove the orifice. Now again, depending on the size of your water heater or boiler, you got to pick the right orifice. Because it's going to be, depending on the size, it could be a, you know, two different orifice sizes. And just reinstall everything and let it rip. You do have to change a dip switch. And that is both on the water heater and on the combi once you go and do, if you're changing it to LP. Should you ever run a natural gas appliance on LP gas for any amount of time? So you're, it's Friday afternoon, your liver's itching. Right? It's happy hour time soon. And the sales guy forgot to send the LP kit to that gas furnace. Or Navian forgot to pack it in their water heater. And you're like, well, I can't leave these people without any hot water. But I got that hooker and cocaine I got to get to. <laughs> so I'm just going to run this for the weekend on LP. You know, even though it's natural, I'll run an LP. That heat exchanger will be so clogged with soot you'll never clean it. You're just going to replace that appliance. 30 minutes, is, you'll probably ruin an appliance running it on, you know, natural gas orifices on LP and vice versa. Do not try it. Let them freeze. Let them not have hot water. But do not try it because it'll burn you. I guarantee you, you will not escape. You not come out unscathed on that. You will not get lucky. The gods will not smile upon you. That you will ruin that appliance. I guarantee it. <clears throat> now, these have, and I don't know how that with the technology that they have, but let's say you forgot to change this dip switch, but you did convert it. The the combi or the water heater will sense that, will notice that, and it'll give you an error incorrect gas input. So it will, it will fall out. <clears throat> so read that line. All Navian units are test fired and adjusted at the factory after assembly. 
nobody's perfect. Now I know a lot of, a lot of our contractors, they plug and play these things, right? They pipe them up, they connect the venting, they plug it in, and they just turn it on, let it rip, and move on. <clears throat> and again, you might get away with it 99 out of 100 times. But the one time it burns you, you're not gonna like it. I suggest on startup, and I even suggest on uh, maintenance, Let's examine the burner and how the burner's performing to make sure it's set up properly. Combustion analyzations probably, in my opinion, would be the most accurate way to make sure that that thing is performing to peak. But you could also do with a manometer and check your gas pressure. So we'll talk about those two methods. <coughs> Excuse me. They put a port right here, right at the, at the vent to be able to insert your combustion analyzer probe. So you have the test port, you turn your analyzer on, again, you let your analyzer um, go through its beginning startup process, make sure it's ready to roll. <clears throat> stick your port, stick your analyzer in that test port, go to the dip switch, one and two on the block of six. There's two banks. There's a bank of eight and a bank of six. And if you set one off and two on, that's low fire. You do vice versa, one on, two off, that's high fire. That's test mode. So it'll go right to a low fire, right to high fire for testing purposes. <clears throat> In our elevation, We're going to verify a natural gas, high fire should be a CO2 of 9.1, low fire 9.3. You, you only adjust, make any adjustments in low fire. You don't make adjustments in high fire if you need to make adjustments. And the only adjustments you can really make are gas pressure, more or less. LP, 10.5 to 10.7 CO2. Or you could do the, uh, the manometer, connect your manometer to the manifold, I call it the manifold side, the burner side of the gas valve. That's your inlet, and that's the burner side. You should have a manometer that can read negative, because it's negative pressure. So if you have an old wire, they only read positive pressure, I think, if I remember. But you need something that's going to read negative pressure, because it's a negative pressure system. Set it to low fire. Let's say we're a 250. Let's say we're LP. We should be negative 0 0.06 plus or minus 0 0.01 inches of water column. That's where we should be. So two ways you can test. Combustion analyzer, manometer. Only adjust in low fire. So if you have to make an adjustment, you do it low fire, make the adjustment, then retest low fire, retest high fire. And for some reason, shit gets out of whack, you make an adjustment low fire, and low fire looks good, but high fire's out of whack, probably gonna need to call Navian at that point to see what the heck's going on. You know, why is that? Why are we why are we all screwed up? Again. A lot of guys just plug and play with these and get away with it. So, um, I would just recommend you do a you do checkout on startup. That's two pipe installation, non-direct. That's one pipe installation for combustion air. <clears throat> but what was the what was the uh, the ground rule if you're going to do combustion air from inside. What's that? For every thousand BDUs of capacity of your appliance, you've got to have 50 cubic feet of free air. I've gone into some shithole houses where they just have shit stacked. Like they're hoarders. Is that what they call them? Hoarders. You know, I think they have TV shows on the shit. <laughs> 
like they just completely stack that's not free space you know free space would be something like this training center you know what I mean not a lot of not a lot of uh, stuff in here <clears throat> but uh, because what what are the possible issues you could have if you do not have enough combustion air what's that might not even it might not light off poor combustion and what happens if you have poor combustion what do you get soot if you ever go to a gas appliance and you see soot there's something wrong that's not normal if it's burning clean there should not be soot could be excessive dirt and chemical or something in the air could be what are the th what are the three things we need for combustion what's that we need we need air right oxygen we need fuel and then we need spark we need heat we need to be able to combust get it to combust so for lacking any of those things we could have bad combustion or no combustion but again you should not see soot on a gas appliance there is something wrong <clears throat> do not exhaust with any other appliance the only time you can do that with Navians, if you're using doing the water heaters when you're cascading, you can do common venting, but there's backflow dampers that you use. There's special uh, pipe size, you know, there's pipe sizing. Should you ever vent a 90% furnace into an existing chimney? What could happen there? You can start, you know, you can, because com that combustion air is acidic. And first of all, you're, you're counting on the buoyancy of that gas, that hot gas, to, to take it out. Well, if you all of a sudden go to two-inch pipe into a, a chimney, you have all that cold and expansion, that gas, that flue gas is going to get, temperature going to drop real quick, and it might not exit the space. So, make sure when it comes to venting to do it right. Have any of you guys killed anybody because you didn't vent it right? That you're aware of? I thought I read somewhere. Or, I thought I read somewhere, maybe, did any of you guys? I, I could have swore it was last year that's, that a contractor somewhere in the country got, got, arrested for because they a family died from combustion and it was malpractice or some kind of malpractice I thought I read something about that you can use two or three inch should you ever go two two three inch like go two for ten feet and then three inch for another thirty really shouldn't and here's the other problem with that is is like let's say you're going horizontal and again I'm horrible at drawing but you go in horizontal at two and then all of a sudden you go up to three there's condensate in this pipe it's going to pull up in here and could cause possibly cause an issue with uh, air pressure switch failures and stuff like that you really want to keep it because I get that question too you know I, I you know it's calling for three inch but what if I go five feet with two and then the rest three I don't I'm not an engineer I can't tell you so if you'd have problems you have to go back and do the three inch so I would just suggest keeping it all if it calls for three keep it all three if it calls for two keep it all two if you're going to do non-direct one pipe keep, be careful of negative pressure in the buildings and you know if the space you have it in you don't want a lot of like chemicals like solvents and crap like that that could 
if you're going to take air from, from inside the space because that could cause issues with the heat exchanger, could cause bad combustion, so on and so forth. In the United States, which is all we care about, screw Canada, is PVC, CPVC, Schedule 40 or 80, solid core, uh, approved polypropylene and approved stainless steel. I mean, I don't know, every job I've gone on has been just straight up Schedule 40 PVC is what I've seen. Now, there are for water heaters, and I think for the combi too, if you're going to go above 130 or 140 for your... Um, I think it comes up and explains it. But if you're going to go to a certain, to a much higher um, vent temperature, because I think it's, it maxes out out of the box at 146 vent temp. If you're going to go above 146, you have to go see PVC for X amount of, the first X amount of feet and then go to PVC. It explains it in, uh, and again, guys, I'm trying to pack a lot of shit into a small period of time. So if I go fast on stuff, forgive me, you know what I mean? I should, in the future, split this up into two separate classes, to be honest with you. Oh, here it is, 149. So, so the combi here has a built-in control to limit exhaust temp to 149. If you're going to go above that, CPV, CPVC, polypropylene, or stainless steel must be used. So in a high temperature system using two pipe, a minimum of the first three feet must be CPVC. If you're going three inch, the minimum of the first, the first five feet's got to be CPVC. So if you're going two inch, you could go a maximum of 65 feet with six elbows. H90 equals eight linear feet of pipe. So six nineties would be equal 48 feet of pipe. 45 is half of that, 4. 3 inch, each 90 is 5 feet of pipe, 45 is 3 feet of pipe. And again, that is different than, you know, ream, a 2 inch 90 is 5 feet. Train, I think a 2 inch was 9 feet, you know what I mean, or it was 5 feet. So it's, it can be different across different manufacturers. So don't just assume because J&J, &J, what do you guys, carrier? A lot of train just because train set does theirs 90s five equals five feet doesn't mean every other manufacturer you're going to want to refer to the installation manual is that long sweep or sweep? what's that long sweep <coughs> long sweep yeah anytime you're uh when these manuals refer to those 90s they're always referring to they're always referring to long sweep you do not have to terminate the intake and exhaust at the same location. I know some manufacturers want the terminations at the same pressure zone or whatever. You do not have to. Again, these lengths are not adding the pipe together. It's just from the boiler to the outside. It's just the one-way length. You're not saying, okay, I've got 30 feet of return of intake. I've got 30 feet of exhaust. That's, that's 30 feet of pipe. That's not 60. So it's just one way. They have, this is something they put in the past few years. They have this vent installation detector. So it's this little switch. Your pipe's got to go in three inches to make that switch. If it doesn't, that switch will remain open and it will not... It'll give you a fault. It'll be locked out because it's, gonna, it's saying, hey, I don't have a solid vent connection. So you got to make sure that that gets in at least three inches to make that switch. Now, I have my theories about why they had to add this because you don't see this on... Um, I don't see it on ream furnaces. I didn't see it on train furnaces. I didn't see it on Amana furnaces. My theory on why they think why they had to add this is dipshit homeowners do it, do, do it yourself on YouTube. And they, you know, they're trying to protect them from killing themselves. Because who here's got on now? I mean, and it annoys the hell out of me, but there is 
unqualified people all over this country trying to install HVAC equipment they should have no business installing. And there's assholes that go on YouTube trying to show them how to do it. Like, you guys are all investing your company and your time here, right? You guys aren't out making money right now. You know, you're investing in training to try to learn, to try to best practice, to do it right, to do it, to, you know, to do it the right way. You guys, I'm sure, either went to school or went, had an apprenticeship or did something. You, you, all your time spent trying to better yourselves to be qualified to do these jobs right, to make them as most efficient and safe as possible. And it just annoys me that you get all these do-it-yourselfers out there that are just... And you watch, sooner or later, Amazon's going to be selling HVAC equipment. You can buy it. Huh? Cool well, yeah, you got those mini-splits. I've never seen one, but I heard about this Mr. Cool. <laughs> that I guess they, it comes with pre-charged line sets, and so they don't have to run a vacuum. And Yeah. Don't get me started. I could spend two hours just talking about that. So, vent termination examples. <coughs> Excuse me. So, this would be an example of a single pipe. We have our vent going outside and we're taking our combustion air from inside to space. You would obviously want to put your cap here. What would be the main reason for that? Right, you don't want kids and stuff just dropping, you know, stuff down inside there, clogging up the intake. This would be a sidewall. We got to have a minimum of 12 inches apart. And why is that? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, but you don't want this exhaust getting sucked right back into the intake. Have you ever heard a burner with the exhaust get sucked back into the intake? They don't sound good. It doesn't sound healthy at all. So you want to make sure you keep, the dis keep that distance. And it's just not good for the burner itself. There's with the snorkel. You got your intake. And look at that note. Exterior termination elbows count towards the total vent length. Again, that changes upon manufacture. Ream, our ream gas furnaces, your termination elbows do not count towards the length. So it, it all depends on the manufacturer. You can use concentrics through the roof, through the sidewall. You got the flat plate concentric sidewall. You do not have to be in the same pressure zone, so you could take intake out the side here and vent out the roof. You know, so there's all kinds of uh, examples of, of ways to vent. And it's really per job, each job. What's the best way to do it? What's going to be the most efficient way to do it? What's going to be the safest way to do it? What's going to be the most cost-effective way to do it? Concentrics, they count as five feet of linear pipe. If you do use a concentric. I have a question on that centric to the right. Is, is that where the air comes in? And where the, air gets the, air's com the air's coming in all along the side here. Is that 12 inches apart? No. But that's probably, that's their design. I'm sure the engineers... You know what I mean? They, they've tested it and designed and saw that that can... But no. It's exhausting out of this pipe. It's intaking along the edges here. That's where it is. But no, it's, I don't think that's 12 inches. Because I... Yesterday, I was putting a boiler in. And I asked my boss about using one of those. He said, no, he doesn't, we don't use it. Because of, because of... I, I don't know. Maybe somebody... W you guys can speak to this. I have never heard so, a good thing said about these type of concentrics. We don't use them. I don't know why. I've just never in my life have heard in my time a positive thing about these type of concentrics. These, I've seen a lot of these go in. But 
and I don't know what the issue is. I don't know if it's, maybe it is getting some combustion. I, I don't know. I've just never heard positive talk about those types. So if you are going to vent into a chamber, you take it the whole way up. If you just egg, let it exit here, that flue gas is going to get cold real quick. It's going to condense. It's going to be acidic. It may not get out of the... It gets cold and it just... What's cold air do? Drops. Cold air drops. Here's the other thing, you gotta make sure, and I've seen this before on jobs, where they were just cutting corners or getting lazy or whatever, and they had a real long horizontal run. Now I'm kind of exaggerating a bit, but you had a dip in that pipe, because they didn't support it. And that pipe dipped. Now that's kind of an exa you know, exaggerated dip, but even a slight dip, you're going to condense and pull up inside there and you might get gurgling noises, you might get pressure switch faults. So you want to make sure you don't have, and you want to pitch the vent back towards the boiler because that's where the condensate exits, right? We have a condensate drain. So you want to pitch it. <clears throat> Improper insulation of the vent system may void the NCBH warranty. Condensate drain, there's your trap. It is acidic. Half inch connection. Use only corrosion resistant material. And they do sell a neutralizer kit depending on where you're going to uh, um, disperse the condensate because you may need to neutralize the acid because you do not want it, depending on where you're dispersing it, it may ruin things. Always test, I would suggest to test the condensate to make sure it drains before you leave the job. So we'll talk about wiring next. And for those that didn't hear me, if there was a service manual that you, you know, if you only got a water heater one, you wanted a combi, first come, first serve, vice versa. So if you, looks like there's plenty up here. So again, 15 amp breaker, it's a plug-in. It's a dedicated circuit, not required, but recommended. I highly recommend it. You need a good earth ground. What's the purpose of having a good earth ground? Flame rectification. Flame rectification, because that's how... <clears throat> I don't want to do a whole electronics class. So we got a burner, we got our flame, got our flame rod. That flame is, conducts electricity, it's a conductor. So it puts a small amount of electricity here and we need to see a completed circuit from this flame the whole way back through the ground of the unit back to the control board. So that conducts electricity because this is, this burner's grounded. We have a small amount of electricity on this, going to this flame rod. We need to see a completed circuit all the way through. So we need a good earth ground. Now, like my house, it's an old Cape Cod. I don't have a good earth ground. And I'm an earth ground. And I put a 90%, so I got my oil furnace replaced, put a 90% gas furnace in, and it works. But I'm lucky. 
It may not work. So if you're having intermittent flame sensor issue, you know, flame failure issues, huh? What's that? Ignition failure or loss of flame, and it's intermittent and you can't figure it out. And again, the first thing most people do is replace the flame rod. Then they replace the board. And you're still having issues. Do you have a good earth ground? Any other thing? If I go, if I go from neutral, if I take my meter from neutral to ground, measuring AC volts, I should read zero volts. If I'm reading any kind of voltage from neutral to ground, that's what they call dirty voltage. So maybe I have a loose neutral at the panel, or I've got a bat, don't have an earth ground, or some other issue, electrical issue that could cause problems with reading flame. Again, local state, local code overrides state code, state code overrides federal code. <clears throat> so on the right side of our combi here is our high voltage connections, our line voltage connections. Over here on the right, on the left side is high voltage, on the right side is our low voltage connections. And again, it does up to three zones, either three zone pumps, three zone valves. So you've got three thermostat connections. So if you're three zones or less, you do not need to add a Calefi or a Taco zone board. But if you're going more than three, then yes, obviously you'd have to add. Can you surf it wouldn't hurt, but they, they don't require it. Do you guys put them on? Do you guys know? Do we sell the plug-in? I just know that we have the ones we sell for mini splits that you wire right into the disconnect. But I don't know if we do or don't. So we have our air, air handler interface. That's if we want to energize a fan on an air handler because we're using a fan coil. So it'll send an output to energize a relay that you could bring a fan on if you're using an air handler with a hot water coil. Your domestic hot water recirculation pump output. Again, if you're doing recirculation on domestic hot water on a standard NPE or a combi, you have to add, you supply the circulator, but you would wire it into here. So anytime it calls for recirculation, it's going to give you a 110, 115 out of that to power that circulator. This is your space heating pumps, zone one, two, three. This is if you're using uh, their universal sensors, whether it be on the supply or the return. <clears throat> Typically residentially, you don't see that. But where you would definitely need that is if you're gonna cascade. Because remember, when you're cascading, you're having two or more water heaters you can't cascade the combis, but you can cascade water here. You need a, so at least a supply sensor. I would recommend supply and return because remember now those two, three, four water heaters are acting as one system. So you don't want to read just the supply temperature at the, the one particular water heater. You want to read supply of the entire system. So if you're going to cascade, you need to purchase. And that's an accessory you have to purchase. It doesn't come with the with the water heaters. Your thermostat inputs, again, you can do up to three zones. If you have to add an external low water cutoff, it has built-in low water cutoff, but again, some commercial uh, codes or maybe even residential codes want to see an external, so that's where you would wire that in. And your zone valve outputs, if you're going to do a zone valve system. So it's going to have a jumper out of the factory. You're going to remove that jumper if you're going to add a low water cutoff, an external low water cutoff. There's your outdoor sensor, return sensor, supply sensor. This is the only sensor that comes with the boiler. And that is for 
outdoor reset. Is everybody familiar with outdoor reset? And again, I'm trying to pack a lot of stuff in here. I think it comes up, but I do want to explain it. Who here, who here has heard of the term outdoor reset? Does everybody know what it, what it is? So basically, if you, have a, if you have a boiler and you have an outdoor sensor connected to it, obviously you have to have this connected, it's going to read outdoor temperature. And then you can set an outdoor reset curve. So out of the box, this can be set for an outdoor reset high temperature of 70 degrees outside. And the low, I think, is 4 degrees or 4 degrees outside. So from 4 to 70, that's your curve. And you can change that. Well, if it's 70 degrees outside, are you going to need all capacity of that boiler? So as the outdoor temperature rises, it's going to limit the capacity that boiler is going to give you to save you money. Because the higher the temperature, the less capacity you're going to need to heat a space. As the temperature drops, it's going to give you more capacity. So it's a money-saving uh, function. So it's going, to, it's going to vary the capacity, output capacity of that boiler depending on the outdoor temperature. Those parameters of 70 and 4 are adjustable. You can change those. So it would behoove you, because they do ship the outdoor sensor, <coughs> they do ship the outdoor sensor with the boiler, with the combi. So it would behoove you to install it and utilize that for money savings. Do you have to? No. You could, just, you could not hook up the sensor, disable it. Because here's the other thing with the outdoor sensor. If you enable outdoor reset and you pick a curve, you can't change your space heating temperatures. That's fixed. It's going to operate off the curve you picked. And I think it talks about it a little later in more detail. But in case it doesn't, I wanted to make sure I explain that. So if you do use outdoor reset, you're going to pick a curve, and then that's fixed. Your homeowner can't go and change their space heating, you know, up or down. It's fixed. Your supply temperature sensors, again, they are accessories. And you would just strap those to the pipe. Air handler terminals, that is to bring a fan on. We get a call for heat. And we're gonna we, we're pal we're heating up a, a, a hot water coil and an air handler. This sends a signal to bring on the blower, so you can energize the blower in that air handler. <clears throat> Domestic hot water priority zone. Circulator connection, zone 1, zone 2, and zone 3, max 2.5 amps. So if zone 3 calls, we're going to get 115 out of zone 3 to energize our pump. So, just for troubleshooting, if I got a call for zone 3 and I'm not getting any heat, what's the first thing you should check for? Do I have 115 here? First thing I would do is jump R to W, get rid of the thermostat. Because it could be a bad thermostat or a bad wire. Disconnect these wires. And I always say that for any troubleshooting. Well, I don't care what appliance you're doing. Get rid of the thermostat. Jump out the functions you want to run. So you, so you eliminate the thermostat or the wires being a problem. So I jump that out so I know I've got a closed connection here. I got a closed loop between R and W. Then I'm going to check for 115 here. If I don't have 115 here, am I going to condemn the board right away? I'm not. I'm going to shut the boiler down, disconnect this pump from the board, power it back up with the jumper in place, and then recheck for 115. Because if this pump starts overdrawing real high, that board will protect itself and, sh and pull the voltage. So you could have a defective pump that's making it look like a defective board. 
So if you disconnect the pump, and now all of a sudden voltage is there, that's telling me you got a bad pump, not a bad pump. So it's just pro troubleshooting's process of elimination. <coughs> they do provide a common, because a lot of thermostats nowadays need a common, right? So they do provide a common. <coughs> There's a place to connect your aquastat or hot button for recirculation. And then zone valves. And they do have the ability, because some zone valves, what? They take a little while to open up, right? They're slow opening. So they do, you can set it up so that the burner doesn't come on, the, the burner doesn't come on, the circulator doesn't come on. It, you can give it a time delay to allow that zone valve to fully open before it energizes the circulator. And that's something you do in the parameter settings. There's your ready link. If you want to do, um, and I'll be honest with you guys, I don't think we've ever sold one of these. Dave, have you ever sold a ready link? Do you know of? I think so. Have you guys sold any Navi link? Are you starting to see guys wanting to do the Wi Fi? So, if we have to go to a generic zone controller, we got our TT connections to then go to a, if we have to add more than three zones, if we need to go to four zones, five zones, six zones. Control dip switches. <clears throat> like I said, there's a bank of six and a bank of eight. The bank of six, really all that's to do is set it to high fire or low fire for testing purposes, switches one and two. One through eight. Okay, this is bank set to, or, or here you can set to normal operation. Full high fire, low fire, or first stage maximum fire. Switch three is not used. Here's the one I wanted to uh, point out, the capacity. If you change a board out, you're going to have to adjust those dip switches to tell it what capacity boiler, because that board's blank. That board can go in all five different sizes. So if you end up having to change a board, you're going to have to make sure you set these dip switches to match the capacity of your actual uh, boiler. Now it would be the same for the water heaters. On your bank of eight, we have what kind of gas, what elevation, is it a well pump or not? So if it's no well pump, we're, we're, we're counting on constant water pressure. If it's well pump, typically what's a well pump? They go in what, 40, 60? Kicks off at 60, kicks on at 40, so you, you're varying pressure. <clears throat> Here's another one to keep in mind. Thermostat. If you have this dip switch set to off, it's looking for a thermostat input to operate the space heating. You won't get any space heating until it sees 24 volts on W, on one zone one, two, or three. So you have to see a thermostat input for that boiler to operate. If you would turn this switch to on, it's going to operate off a of continuous operation, meaning if you have it set to 180 with a differential of 10, it's just going to constantly be 180 to 170. 180 to 170, it's just going to nonstop 24-7 maintain that set point. It's still, it won't care about any thermal connections. It's just going to maintain a constant temperature. I don't know residentially where that would be useful. Do you, is anybody here? because I think that's just going to consume a lot of fuel. So 99 of under times, you're going to have that switch off, which it comes off from the factory. It's looking for a thermostat connection. And then the exhaust limit, <clears throat> again, if you go no limit, remember you have to have CPVC for the first X amount of feet, depending on two or three inch. <clears throat> Control panel. There's your display. 
So we'll explain what all of these mean. If you have outdoor reset and you enable it, you're going to see this symbol. That's supposed to be a flame. Anytime the burner's on, you should see that symbol. Anytime that burner is on. If you see the wrench, that means there's a problem. Now, you can have a wrench and it flashing red and that boiler and water heater will still operate. <laughs> there are some conditions where it says, I don't like what I'm seeing, but I'm not shutting down operations. If you ever see that wrench and it's flashing, but you're not seeing an actual error, move this dial, turn that dial and then it'll show you what it's, what, what it's not happy about. Freeze protection. So what happens during freeze protection? It runs the pump, right? So it defaults 50 degrees. So if it sees the water temp get below 50 degrees, it'll run the pump every so often to keep flow so we don't get frozen pipes, frozen water in the pipes. So you see that symbol anytime it's in freeze protection. If you're cascading, you see the M. In domestic hot water, you see, I guess that's a faucet. So anytime it's domestic hot water. Space heating. So if we have one, two, or three zones, it's going to tell you which zone is calling or which zone's not calling. Domestic hot water, that'll also say on if there's a demand. Space heating set point, domestic hot water set point, it'll tell you what the outdoor temperature is and your system pressure. What's a typical system pressure you would want to see in a boiler system? What's that? Is it 12? I mean, that's what it's default to make sure it maintains. Is that normal? I'm asking you guys. I don't know. 12 to 15? Is it normal? And then we've got our back button. That's to go to previous screen or return to main menu. This is to enter the boiler main menu. That is strictly to get into the basic settings because... We don't want the homeowners getting the advanced settings. We talked about this. I think we had an oil class here Tuesday, and we talk about this in every class. What is the worst customer out there to deal with? Retired engineer. We don't want retired engineers getting in there and screwing around. And then obviously we got our power button to turn it on or off. <clears throat> and then the command dial, you either rotate it or you press. Who here knows what the password is to get into advanced settings? One, two, three, four. <clears throat> so prior to turning that boiler on, you want to make sure you have it filled and, and all air out and it's purged, no more, no air, and the system's completely filled. <clears throat> if you have air in the system on startup, you could lose the pump or you could get that heat exchanger could get hot real quick. Because if you have air in a system, you not, might not be moving water through. Could be locked. And if you're not moving water, you're not transferring heat. And all that heat will just go into that heat exchange and it will rise real fast. If you turn it off, the unit will not operate, but pr freeze protection does remain. So even if that boiler is off, it does have freeze protection. Startup wizard. So anytime you first start it up, it's going to take you through the initial basic settings. So you can do that right away. They call it the startup wizard. Now, let's say you screw up in startup wizard and you didn't quite, you, you got the date wrong or you put the gas type wrong because you, you still have to input, even though you switch the dip switch, you still have to tell it through startup what gas type you have. You can go into parameter settings in advanced and, and make those changes. So just Startup, startup wizard is not once and done. If you screw up, you can go back in and, and change things. But it will not let you start up that boiler. That burner will not come on until you complete the startup wizard process. <clears throat> now, 
And it's a pretty simple process. You're going to verify a gas type. Even though we did that dip switch, we still have to verify it in the startup wizard. <clears throat> You're going to out, are we enabling outdoor reset? We've got to set the curve. Set our outdoor high temp or outdoor low temp and our warm weather shutdown. Warm weather shutdown would be, and just so you know, and I think it talks about it here, but I'm kind of going all over the place. You could tell that boiler, okay, at this temperature outside, you're not running at all. The boiler part. The water heater obviously still remains. So you could say, you could set your curve to be zero degrees to 60 degrees for your outdoor reset, and then warm weather shut down 65. So if it gets to 65, it doesn't matter what they're doing with their thermostat, it's not going to give them heat. Now you have to be careful where you set that, because I, no offense, I don't see many old people here. <laughs> um, but th I've been to a lot of houses where there's some older people get chilly, even in warmer temperatures, right? So you want to keep that in mind, depending on your customer, and maybe conversation with them about where they think that shutdown should take place, if you even want to set it. <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to set your recirculation. Are we doing no recirculation? Again, no recirculation means your supply out to the fixtures, return back, they turn a faucet on, burner comes on, and once it heats up, um, you know, they get hot water. Now on the combi, be preheat, and then you can do external recirculation. And then you can set your, you know, always on intelligent weekly and same thing with your external preheat after you do all of this you're going to go into air purge operation who here knows how long air purge is 900 seconds, 900 seconds. and what's that in minutes 15. 15 minutes so keep that in mind because once it goes into air purge I, unless you like, kill power, I don't. It's not, you can't get out of it. You'd have to recycle the unit, I think. But but you, there's no way of getting out of it once it goes into air purge. So you got 15 minutes of it, and basically it's shutting the pump on and off to try to remove. And it's, it's hoping you you know you you undid your vent up top and trying to get the air out of the system. In normal operation, you can rotate this dial to to change your different set points if outdoor resets disabled. If it's enabled, you can't change your space heating. It is whatever curve you picked, and it stays there. Some of this stuff I'm going to blow through a little bit. And if, if there's something you see that I blow through that you want me to explain, don't hesitate to, to speak up. So once you set your, they can change their space heating temperature if the outdoor reset's not enabled. And then once they change it, they just press the button to save it. Your supply temp settings 104 to 180, return 86 to 149. Where would you have low supply temp? What kind of job would you have a low supply temp of maybe 110? Radiant heat right why don't we want to put 180 degrees in our floors could crack the concrete if you could burn like way overheat the house again if outdoor reset is enabled heating control cannot be adjusted No, space, good, that's a good question. Space heating zones, it, it's, you're just doing one space heat temperature. Each zone has to abide by that one temp. You can't set zone 1 to be 160, zone 2 to be 140, zone 3 to be 180. 
That would probably be nice if you could could yeah, do that. There's a lot, a lot of you know radiant tubing, and then you got you know baseboard. You can put on you know two zones that way. And, you know, baseboard is more hotter than the radiant than the baseboard. And the, you know, running. Well, with, if you if you were doing baseboard and radiant, you'd have to do a mixing valve type scenario to to do that. It would be nice to if they could do that. I mean, that's something to. It's a good question. But yeah, let's say like like what was just brought up is let's say you have two different types of of heating in a house. You have radiant floor in one part, and you have baseboard in another. Again, you only get to pick one supply temp for your space heating. You'd have to use a mixing valve or something for your radiant to be able to bring that temperature down to wherever you need. Typically, I think radiant in floor is what, 110 to 120? Some cases might be a little lower. It will retain all of its settings if you lose power. So if you lose power, you're not going to have to go back in and, and it's not going to be a service call that you have to come back and fix everything or reset everything. <clears throat> At what temperature do you, can you scold your uh, self? Huh? Yeah, 120 over five minutes. What's it at 130? Yeah, it's it's pretty quick at 130. I mean, some of these homeowners, I wish they'd scald themselves. <laughs> One time, somebody, because I always, I'm always, you know, because I deal with homeowners all the time, going to job site visits, and I tell you what, in the past 20 years, they've became much more pain in the ass. I mean, people's patience and tolerance and ex expectations are just. But then a guy at one class reminded me I'm a homeowner. <laughs> What's that? And a pain, hey, I'm a pain in the ass. <laughs> domestic supply has hot, domestic hot water supply has priority. So let's say the unit space heating and you got zone one's calling and it's, and it's, it's space heating if all of a sudden they need hot water that heat's going towards the hot water so everybody got that if you get an error if you get a fault this is what it's going to look like you can press the and now it's going to give you an actual error if you call into me and you've got this issue, this is what I want to know. What's this number? ERR, what's after that? It's going to tell you what was, what's the failure. It gives you a little snippet here, something to check. And here's a nice thing. It gives you the date and the time. And why would that be important? Because it, 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 I think it holds 10 faults in its, in its memory. So if they keep getting an ignition failure and it's happening at the same time every day, that's a hint. That's something to look at. What's happening during that time of day? Maybe they don't have a big enough meter. And at that time of day, they're turning the fireplace on and their gas dryer and their gas, you know what I mean? And, and you, can, you can kind of, you know, investigate it a little better if it's always, a, you see a pattern. Okay, it's... We get ignition failure every night at 7 p.m., around 7 p.m. Okay, what's happening at 7 p.m.? Press the back button to reset the boiler. Now, here's the thing. If the fault still remains, it's not going to reset. So if you hit the reset button, but the high limit's still open, it's going to go right back into a failure. It's not going to, it's not a fix-all. Now, if the condition's not there, Right? Let's say it opened on high limit, but now the high limit's closed, and you hit the reset, it'll clear, and it'll, it'll fire off again. We have two different menus. We have the main menu. This is the basic information, and then we have the installer service menu. This is where your parameter settings are. Again, we do not want homeowners getting into this. And I have run into jobs 
where we go out, we set a boiler or a water heater or a furnace or a heat pump zoning system and we set it up and we have it where we want it and then they call they call H.B. McClure say this thing's not working right you guys get out there and the settings changed and they swear they didn't touch it and you you call tech support and they say okay put it back here and then you know two days later how the hell are these settings changing and I've had told I've told homeowners in the past we're not doing this anymore like we're not coming back it works, leave it. If you change it, you own it. So all you gotta do to access the basic menu is just hit M. And these are what you're gonna get. Status information, space heating operation, domestic operation, and you can get error history. <clears throat> I hate when PowerPoints have all, you gotta keep clicking, clicking, clicking. You can, if you are unsure about setup, and you think maybe you have something set incorrectly or you're not sure, you can go in and put it back to default, to factory, like it just came out of the box, and then just go through and reset up stuff. Because there are a lot of different parameters that you can set up, you're gonna see. I mean, I'm gonna blow through some of them, but there is a lot of different things. So if you're unsure and it's like, man, you can just set it back to factory reset and just start from scratch. And sometimes, it's beneficial to do that. So you can see the current operation state. What's it doing? Is it space heating right now? Is it domestic hot water heating? What's your space heating te set temperature? What's your domestic hot water set temperature? What's your software version of your panel? But here are all, there's 24 right here and there's even more. What's the heating capacity at? Is it at 30%? Is that 60%? What's our supply, boiler supply and return temps? Heat exchanger outlet temperature. What's our outdoor temperature? What's our water pressure? Flame values. Flame is off if you are reading greater than, equal to or greater than 175, flame is on if you are less than, equal to or less than 70. What's your fan doing? What's our flow control valve doing? What's our mixing valve doing? Our exhaust temperature? Outdoor reset, is that enabled? What's our gas type? So there's a lot of information you can see in there. That's your set temp. That's where you can come in and set your uh, space heating target temperature. Now, if you set a target temperature of 180, it's going to go to about 187, 188 before it shuts down. So it overshoots, and that's its kind of differential. It's about a 7, 8 degree for space heating. So if you're watching it and you have it set to 180, it's going to go to about 187 before the burner will shut down. And I think the default and you guys can change this and you'll see the default um, differential to come back on is 10 degrees. So if that water drops to below 170, the burner comes back on. Everybody got that? But you can see the default setting is 180. You're gonna tell, you're gonna tell it what type of zone. Do we have zone pumps or zone valves? It's default for pumps. Is our outdoor reset on or is it off? So if we enable, again, I'm gonna keep repeating this. If you enable outdoor reset, you cannot manually change the space heating temperature. It's fixed. It's whatever curb you set. Here's the curves you get to choose from. Fan, fin tube baseboard, fan coil, cast iron, low mass, high mass, radiator, or you could do a custom curve where you can just set your on, your low temp and your high temp. Who here, who here would consider themselves a boiler expert? Because I have a question. Uh, this is my question. What's the difference? What's low mass versus high mass? Overall volume of water in the system. But what would, what, what would 
a low mass boiler look at look like versus a high mass? Just have to run a lot to get if it's if it's just a what? It's just a big boiler with just a lot of water. This is if you if you enable outdoor reset, then you will have this option. If you disable outdoor reset, you won't even see that. And like I said, you can pick one of these curves, and I think there's a slide show, coming up that shows you the different curves. Or you can customize it. You can say, I want 0 to 70. That's my, my low temp, 0, my high temp, 70. So here, if you look at this, so fin 2 baseboard, If we look here, fin tube baseboard, that's this dotted line, right? So we see here at negative four degrees, we'll be at full capacity, 180. Because at negative four, we're going to need some freaking heat. And again, we don't really get to, but guys remember last Christmas Eve? I think here in Camp Hill with the wind chills, it was like negative 11, I think, it got down to. So... Yeah, it was one day, but it's still, you know, it can happen. But you can see, as our outdoor temperature starts to increase, the capacity of that boiler drops, 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 drops. And you can see, we get to 104, it's shutting off. So, these are your different curves. Custom, you can make anything you want as long as you're within these parameters. But let's say here, if we go on the low mass radiant, at negative 4, the max you're going to get out of is 140 degrees. That's setting your maximum outdoor temperature for your curve if you're going to do a ma if you're going to do. This will only come up if you do custom. Yeah. If you pick the curve, it's already set. Your low temp. Default is, is 14 degrees. Typically when we do low calcs, I recommend, and I think I think you know our people across the street are doing it, we do zero degree for heating. But if you, I don't know if you guys are familiar with software programs or manual, um, manual J. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania is 11 degrees, as they consider that worst case. It's, it's 11 degrees. But I recommend doing zero when doing low calcs. Warm weather shutdown. This is where you can say, okay, if I'm above this temp, that boiler's not running no matter what. I don't care what the homeowner's doing with the thermostat. Warm weather, weather shutoff differential. So that's all that's saying is if you set it for 65, at 65 or above, it's not going to run. But if you leave it at a default 5 degrees, it has to fall down to 60 before that will bring that boiler back on. You do have an adjustable 0 to 36 degrees. So again, that's your default. Navian zone control. Operate zone utilizing the Navian zone controller. Space heating control method. Default setting, it's looking at the boiler supply. You could do system supply, system return if you had those accessory uh, sensors that you'd have to purchase. Or boiler return. Domestic hot water, set temp and recirculation. Set the domestic hot water supply. Defaults 120. Domestic hot water recirculation. This is for a single unit. Are we doing no recirculation? Are we doing combi preheat? And basically that's just going to try to preheat the heat exchanger inside 
per the sched per the the method you tell it you want it to do to try to just make sure that heat exchanger and the domestic hot water flat plate heat exchanger is always up to temp. Then you would not need a circulator, but all that's doing is heating the, t the heat exchanger at the combi or the water heater. So if you have a fixture that's 300 feet away, that hot water is hot at that unit, it still has to travel 300 feet. Or you can do external recirculation, that is you have to add a circulator, which we talked about. Always on for combi preheat, but again, what's the negative downfall of that? You're going to be using much more fuel utilization. You have much, you know, more fuel because you're constantly going to be trying to keep that tank warm. You could do intelligent, it's looking back at the past, I talked about this before, it's looking at the past seven days. And it's saying, okay, I saw domestic hot water demand at 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. all seven days. So now the next seven days, it's going to start recirking at 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. And then you can do weekly. One day, three day, seven day. And you can set a schedule. Say, hey, now I don't know, it's not real, I don't think. Maybe somebody like me who's single and doesn't live, well, I live alone. If you've got, you know, multiple people living a house on multiple schedules, that probably doesn't make sense. And then external recirculation. Again, you got to add that pump. You can do always on, intelligent, weekly, or you can use an aquastat or hot button. And this is just setting your weekly schedule. Who here, who here does service? What's your, I always ask this in every class, what's your recommendation? If you go to a, a job site and they've got faults in the system, and I don't care if it's a boiler, a water heater, a furnace, do you clear the faults when you leave or do you leave them in? You leave them in? What, what's your purpose? Does everybody agree with that, or, or is it clear them? I've always been, I've always been the type to clear them, just because for I don't know, I'm just anal. I just want to get them. But I see your point, because patterns, guys. Look at patterns. If something's failing at the same time every day, that's a big clue. It could be like level, What's that? Yeah, it's like this gentleman brought up, it could be on an annual or seasonal, right? Or it fails at Christmas Eve and Christmas Day every year. Well, what's happening then? We got, we got a shit ton of people all visiting at the same time, and now they put such a demand on our, this water heater they couldn't, it can't handle it. You know what I mean? So there's, there's you know, so he makes a good point. I tend to clear them, but it is nice because they do give you date and time. Advanced menu, you got to hold these two buttons in for three seconds. And I bet you there's some dipshit on YouTube that's telling people that so anybody can access. But that's to get you, that's for installers and service guys. That shouldn't be for homeowners and for do-it-yourselfers and stuff like that. that. This is where you can see service status info. You can set the cascade, all your parameter settings. I know this is kind of boring, guys, but it's part of the level two training, so I got to go through this, some of the stuff. But um, I tell you what, though. And if you heard this joke before, don't say anything. But I'm going to tell you a joke. <clears throat> so there was this, this young, this, uh, not young guy, he's in his 40s. He's lived in the city his entire life. He was born in the city. So he's worked in the city. 
And he got to be in his 40s, and he just got fed up with the shit. He got fed up with the hustle and bustle. He got fed up with the noise. He got fed up with the traffic. He said, I'm moving to the country. <clears throat> so he finds a house, a little piece of land and a house way out in the country. He moves out there, and he's getting settled in. And it takes him a couple weeks. I mean, I'm sure you guys have all moved before. He's getting settled in. And uh, it's about two weeks later, he's like, you know what? I should go to meet my neighbor. Now, again, he's way out in the country. His neighbor, nearest neighbor, is like three miles away. So he drives down the road, pulls up in this driveway, knocks on the door. And this gentleman answers the door. And he's like, hey. And, and City Boy introduces himself, says, hey, I just moved out. I'm your neighbor. I just wanted to meet you. <coughs> and uh, so they're talking. They're hitting it off a little bit. And finally, the uh, neighbor says, you know what? I'm having a party tomorrow. You should City Boy's like, that's awful nice of you. He's like, is there anything I should do, bring? He's like, no, but I got to warn you. There's a lot of fighting and fornicating in my parties. <laughs> City Boy's like, all right, I'm down. What time should I be there? He says, it doesn't matter. It's just the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> all right, advanced installer service menu. So here's all your options. Service status, input, output statuses. So what's your, you know, is the boiler being, or is the, the pump being energized? Is the zone valve being energized? Parameter settings, cascade, that's where you'd set cascade. External connections, test mode. You can go in and you can say, I want the fan to run. Or you can say, I want my system circulator to run. Or you can say, I want my three-way valve to, to open and close. So you can test, I, you know, you can test, uh, I want to test my dual venturi, have it open and close. External connections, special operation mode. And you could go back in if you, if you for some reason, have error in the system, you could put it in error purge mode manually. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to give you an overview, it's going to tell you. All right, it failed to, it took X amount of second attempts to ignite. So you could look at that. Maybe the boiler is never fully locked out, but you can look at this and see, wait a second, it's been having some misfires here. Maybe I need to look at the gas pressure. Maybe I need to do combustion analyzation, something like that. Your input-output statuses, thermostat connections. Is, am, I, am I energizing my zone valve, my pumps? What's my high limit doing? What's my low water cutoff doing? So I'm just kind of giving you the, I'm not going to cover each one of these, but just give you an overview of what it's kind of looking at. Parameter settings, again, one, two, three, four, pretty difficult password. I hate it, though, is because I always get to three or four, and then I hit the button, the wrong button by accident, and then I got to redo it. Because how you do it is you press... You turn the dial until it gets to one, then you press the button. Then you turn the dial until it gets to two, and then you press the button. Then you turn the dial until it gets to three, and so on and so forth. This is where you can set your supply minimum set points, max set points, return min set points. And I apologize, but I'm going to blow through these because they're just, just telling you what the things you can do. Burner off differential. This one I want to just touch on real quick. When the burner's off, to cycle the burner off when the space heating temperature overshoots the target temp. So default, it's about four degrees. So if you set to 180, I've always seen in the field about seven degrees because it still has to, you know, react. But that's when it's going to turn the burner off. That's when it's going to turn it on. Oh, it's default for five, actually. So if you're set to 180, it gets to 184 in theory. I always see 187. Then it has to drop down to 175 before it'll bring it back on. I would probably change that to 10, 15, maybe even 20, depending on the situation. But again, these are real high efficiency boilers, too. So. Minimum limit. Here's another one that you can do. Who here has ever had a sales guy oversize a piece of equipment? Let's say 
Oh, this is a different one, sorry. Oh, this is raising the minimum output. This is, uh, the other one's coming up. Let's say you realize that if this thing turns down to its lowest turndown ratio, that that's just not enough. Or it need, you want it to get to its high, high capacity faster. You can set the minimum higher, the minimum percentage. You can tighten up the turndown ratio make a smaller turn down ratio. So it's, it, the, it's low capacity is at a higher than the default, if that makes sense. This is the one, if they oversized it, maybe you're seeing short cycling, and maybe this, it's just oversized, you can say, you know what, I'm gonna set max capacity at 80% instead of 100. And maybe that gets you out of a short cycling oversized situation out of the box it's you know 100 percent minimum burning time once that burner fires it's going to be one minute no matter what it takes three minutes default once that boiler fires up it fires and it goes to low it's going to stay there for three minutes until it'll start to ramp up by demand so first three minutes it's going to be in low fire Again, you can change that to 0 to 20. Zone valves, like I said, if you have a, a, want a, a startup delay, you have those slow opening zone valves, right? Until the valves are open, you can set that to up to two minutes. You can set the, the, once it shuts off, that burner will not come on for three minutes. That's its anti-short cycling. You can change that to 0 to 20. Domestic hot water limit, minimum max, freeze protection defaults 50, auto fill pressure set to 12. And again, that's when that auto fill will start to let water in until it sees pressure come up to 12 or five minutes because we don't want to flood the space. <coughs> Boiler pump delay. This changes the duration of the pump, continues to run after this, the space heating off differential is reached. If the supply temperature remains above limit, pump will turn off after set time. Default's 40 minutes. Domestic hot water weight. Let me see. Domestic hot water wait time. So, after you lose, you have a domestic hot water call, they, they turn off all their fixtures, there's no more call for domestic hot water it's not gonna go back into heating, space heating for three minutes. So domestic's done, it's, they, they have a call for space heating, it'll take three minutes before it'll go back to space heating. Recirculation interval time, recirculation sampling time, uh, differentials for recirculation, fixture difference if you're doing hot button, I don't think we've ever sold a hot button service notification times, gas connect error check. If it sees the wrong gas type setting, it's gonna give you that. This is where you guys can put your phone number in, contact information. I once worked with a guy, he was an older gentleman. He did like applications engineering at one of my old jobs. And when he would go to a job site visit and meet with customers, if it went well, he'd give them his card. If it went bad, he gave them another employee's card. <laughs> and then here's where you can do, here's where you can do factory reset. That's where if you're not sure, or they've been screwing around, or you don't know, you're, you're coming in on the job that six guys have been there before, and nobody's been able to figure it out. Maybe you just say, you know what, I'm just gonna put this back to factory and just reset it up the way you know it should be, rather than going through all the parameters in the book and trying to figure out you know, what they did. Maybe just reset the, the thing, start from scratch, and start new. Sometimes it's good to just start new. What if they change the password from factory reset before you get into advanced settings? No. If another company locks you out. If another company locks you out, I think, I believe if you call Navian, there is a way to get around it. 
but I, I think you got to, as far as I know, contact them. I think there is a, if you, and that's a good question because a lot of times Allison might install it, but Integrity ends up servicing it. Maybe, what's your name? Andy. Andy? Maybe Andy pissed them off and they just didn't like Andy. And they're like, you know what? We're calling Integrity from now on for service and you changed the password and now you can't get into advanced options. That could be a problem. I, uh, I wish they were here. Um, I, really, I think if you call Navi and they, there is a workaround to get there. And again, this is where you can change the password. So if you wanted to be a dick, you could just go change passwords on all your, and then just treat the customer like shit so they call somebody else. Because that's what I was wondering too, like with Bluetooth now, because like our Ream equipment, most of it you have to, I talked about this earlier, you have to use Bluetooth with your phone and the app to go in and change the settings. Well, you could be 30 feet, 40 feet away, and that Bluetooth may connect. So maybe that homeowner was a real pain in the ass. Maybe you stop by later that evening, <laughs> sneak into their yard, sneak into their yard, start, turn the heat on. Test mode, this allows you to test all the different functions, the fan motor, the boiler pump, the zone one pump. A lot of redundancy in this. I'm blowing through these because I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So all these things you can test. You can set it into different operations. You can put it into air purge mode. So you don't have to, just because, you can do air purge on the beginning of the install, right? Once you're done with Startup Wizard, it's gonna have you do air purge. But if for some reason you need to get rid, you know, you got air in the system again, you can go in here and redo it. So, I just want to hit on these real quick for the service guys. I'm not going to hit on all of them, but if you're getting a heat exchanger over temperature error, what's most likely your problem? What's that? We don't have, we're probably restricted or no flow through the unit, right? Do we have a bad heat exchanger? Do we have bad, well, not good massive scaling that, that causes restriction? they undersize the piping or they undersize the circulator or air in the lines. So it could be any number of things. Ignition failure, it could be a gas pressure issue. We don't have enough volume. We needed to have three quarter inch pipe. We, they installed half inch pipe. Could be flame rod. It, it's igniting, but the flame rod's not seeing it. Flame loss detection, flame, or false flame detection. I'm telling you right now, if you see a false flame detection, it's the board. 999 times out of 1,000, it's the board if you see a false flame detection. Flame loss. Could be a grounding issue. Could be a polarity issue. Could be a bad flame sensor. Could be uh, undersized gas pipe. But it works when just the boiler's on, but when you add other appliances, gas appliances, now all of a sudden your gas drops. So, low water pressure, which you'll, there's no code because you actually see the actual pressure reading on it. High water pressure, what could cause high water pressure? What's that? If we have a, a bad expansion tank, What's that? PRV. Bad PRV? And just for, and I assume everybody knows, it, pressure reducing valve is what you're talking about. What's the, does anybody know, like New Cumberland, I think, right on the street, like there's, it's like from the street. What's that? Really? Whew. And then this is just going to, if you, it sees thermistors open, you know, open or shorted. 
dip switch settings aren't set correctly. Wrong gas detected, low water cutoff is open. But these are, if you call in and you've got an error, this is the number I want to, you know, I'm going to get from you. But it is real super nice. Keep these with you if you're running service or you're doing startups and need help. This, every single thing that can fail, this tells you how to troubleshoot it. And it tells you how to disassemble all the different parts and pieces. Again, do not apply power to these until you have everything flushed and purged. So what's the first thing we're going to do? What are we going to, we're going to flush and purge the system first, right? Get the system filled up, all air out of the system. Make sure we get any debris, if there's, you know, copper shavings or any other kind of crap. <clears throat> and you're going to then slowly, once you get it flushed and purged, you're going to open the valves to allow the water to get into the system, the boiler. And you're going to open that air vent, and you want to make sure air is coming out of that. After you get done filling the boiler, you want to check all your wiring, make sure that's squared away. You're going to plug that puppy in and turn the switch on. Now there's an on and off switch. After initial power up, the boiler will check pressure and open the autofill valve as needed, like we talked about, 12 inches or 12 psi. If it falls below that, it'll autofill. And you're going to complete the, the, set, the startup wizard, give it a demand, and then rock and roll. Here's the other thing to keep in mind. They have uh, technical support seven days a week. I think they're the only manufacturer that does it seven days a week. You call me on the weekend, I'm either drunk or looking for Bigfoot. I'm not answering the phone. <laughs> so... But they, you could call them seven days a week. Um, and check it out. Monday through Friday, up to 9 p.m. Eastern. Saturday and Sunday, it's 8 to 8 Eastern time. So you have support. on the, If you guys do, who here has to do on call? Whew, that sucks. <laughs> They do have a training academy in Morristown, New Jersey. I, if you're doing a lot of these, um, you might want to look at trying to go. I mean, you can, obviously you have to pay your own way as far as hotel and, and drive. I wouldn't want to drive there, you know, commute back and forth. It's about two hours, two and a half hours from here.